All right, hey everyone. So this is the lecture for chapter 11. Uh, we're not going to be here very long today because um, these chapters are going to move pretty fast. I've, I've made uh, as few assignments in Alex. I mean, there's still a good deal of assignments. Let's take a look real quick and see what all we got to do. Um, so this is your Cougar View homepage. And then you also have Alex. So you, uh, if you watch the intro video, you should be familiar with all this. I'm going to go into the student view real quick because I want to look at some of the problems. All right, so I think there's only 12 objectives in Chapter 11 that you need to worry about, which is one of the more, like, this is one of the chapters with the most objectives but these I went through these before I did this video and they're really not bad okay you, you shouldn't get hung up in too many spots uh, if you do just email me and make sure y'all can still see what I'm saying okay if you do get hung up with anything email me right away you know you don't want to waste a lot of time and get frustrated uh, entering in the wrong answers unless you know what you're doing wrong so if you have a question about uh, the way that it's being asked or the way it's worded whatever email me immediately let's try to if it's something easy send me a screenshot of the problem you're working on uh, that also helps because I'm not always at my computer um, we can get it addressed quickly and get you moving on okay don't worry about the uh, grade all right really all I'm looking for is completion if you can get through all of these topics then you'll get a hundred for this section okay so, um, like I said, I went through these, uh, and it's not that bad, so I'm going to try to cover everything that you'll need to know to be able to complete this, and then a lot of what we learned today is going to be helpful going forward in other chapters as well, okay? So, I'm going to go back to Cougar View. You want to check on the announcements every time you come into Cougar View just to make sure nothing's changed. And then another note I want to make, uh, so we're at Chapter 11 today. When you go to open the PowerPoint, uh, there is a couple of things you can do. Number one, you could download it and then load it onto your own Microsoft Office or PowerPoint program so that you can view it that way. Because Cougar View has been a little tricky. See, when it first shows up, it'll show up like this. And it's not very uh, conducive to running through. I don't know why it got loaded in like this. Uh, I've messed with it several times. The best thing that I can do is open it with the doc reader and then that automatically lets it know that it's a PowerPoint presentation and it'll set it up like this right here. Okay, so then I can go through and click on each individual slide and it'll transition to the next. Okay, so uh, before I get into that, I, w I do want to talk about the other things that I have here in chapter 11. So all of the, if you watch all of these videos here, uh, intro, to, intro to Organic Part 1 and Part 2, that's from Melissa Maribel. Um, I, I like the way that she teaches. Um, her and Tyler DeWitt are probably my two favorites. And then Naming Alkanes, I can't remember who did that. Um, it might also be Melissa. But then there's this, What is Organic Chemistry? And this is just kind of alluding to the fact that you're not getting real deep into the weeds of what organic chemistry is all right survey is just meant to kind of briefly skim the surface uh introduce you to the topic maybe give you some uh tips about naming and what when you see a molecule you can recognize what kind of molecule it is but as far as reactions and everything we're not going to do a bunch of that so you're not necessarily doing any full-fledged organic chemistry now we will get in some to some harder subjects that has to do with organic chemistry and uh, I'll mention that when we get there okay but this is just kind of an introduction video lets you know what is organic chemistry uh, what are organic chemists doing in the world so on and so forth alright so with that being said let's get into today's lecture I just want to briefly go over a couple of things um, most of this is just going to be about naming and uh, identifying different functional groups. So uh, all in all, this chapter seems to be, I think everybody will do better. Typically, students do better in Survey of Chem 2 than they did in Survey of Chem 1. 
Uh, the main drawback for uh, Survey of Chem 1 is all the math. This section will not have much math at all. I can't think of any off the top of my head. But so people that are not good at math uh, typically struggle with Survey of Chem 1. But most everybody, if you get in here and memorize the rules to naming and uh, the basics of organic chemistry, then you'll typically do real well in this course. Now we're also going to talk about some biochemistry and some inorganic chemistry and stuff like that, but uh, mainly to start, the first half of the course is just kind of an introduction and overview of organic chemistry. All right, so what is organic chemistry? Organic has to deal with the study of compounds that contain the element carbon, okay? Anything that has carbon in it or carbon chain molecules, that will be considered an organic uh, compound or molecule. Okay, and typically uh, everything living is built from carbon chain molecules, um, our skin, uh, the proteins, the tissue walls, everything is built of carbon. So that's how come a lot of people say organic, they think about living things, but it's not just living things. There's also um, Fabrics, right? Well, I guess a fabric would be mostly made out of something that was alive at one point, cotton or uh, wood, stuff like that. Silk comes from worms. So it's, it's, I typically think of it as being an organic molecule. Um, what else? So plastics. Plastics are a good example of uh, organic molecules that are non-living. Uh, we chain together a bunch of carbons together and make these PVC plastics and stuff like that. So that is um, everything that has those carbon-carbon bonds is considered an organic molecule. Okay. So uh, before I go there, I want to talk about carbon-carbon uh, bonds real quick. Let me pull up my paint program. So just kind of revisiting the... Survey of Chem 1, in case some of you hadn't had it in a while. Let me see if I can get my paint program up. All right. So uh, let me draw something size about here. Remember when we were talking about carbon in the last semester, we said that carbon has four valence electrons, and thus it likes to be bonded four different times okay so this is kind of a general rule that we're going to use for our class uh, not all organic chemistry but for the purposes of this course you always want to look for carbon to have four bonds okay this can mean four single bonds uh, this can mean a double bond and two singles okay let's say this an H and an H right but Pretty much, for our purposes, you're always looking for carbon to be surrounded by four bonds because it has four valence electrons. Okay, so this is just a general thing that you want to keep with you and uh, remember no matter what. Okay, unless there's a charge here associated with this, like a little negative or a little positive around this carbon, there will always be four bonds to a carbon. Now, this is what makes carbon... Uh, the building block of life, so to speak, is that it creates these bonds. They're very stable and they're very predictable. Um, and they can just keep bonding. We can just keep adding carbons, carbons, carbons. That's how we make plastics is we start with a little piece and then we add a carbon, 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 carbon until we've got these long chain molecules that end up becoming plastics or uh, cotton or whatever right graphite pencil lead stuff like that so carbon is always bonded four times no matter what for for this course we're just going to think about bonding always having four bonds on a carbon all right so let me go back to the powerpoint okay characteristics um these are just examples i'm going to kind of skip to the good stuff and so I loaded these on from Alex uh, they have 
way more information than we really need. I didn't have time to go in there and pick out the ones I wanted to take out. So I'm just going to leave the whole thing. Take time. Feel free to kind of go through everything and read it. Uh, because I'm sure it'll reinforce whatever it is that it's teaching. Uh, typically, when it's like when it's this much, I like to go through the text because it'll have more context uh, to everything that it's saying. All right, so these are just examples of organic compounds, and I'm not really okay. Here goes uh, a good start right here. Here are the rules. The rules are: carbon has four bonds, hydrogen only has one bond. Okay, that's the first rule. You can write it down and put it in your notebook. All right, carbon can form single, double, or triple bonds. Right, we knew that. But either way, notice that all these carbons still have four bonds around it. This carbon here has three on the right, one on the left. This one here has three on the left, one on the right. The hydrogens only have one bond, so that's a rule you need to hold on to. Four bonds for carbon, one bond for hydrogen. Okay, uh, so we call this a chain when they're just kind of linked together linear like that. We call those a chain, and then when they come together, we either call it a ring or a cyclic compound cyclic is uh, was it c-y-c-l-i-c -C -C? let me write it down real quick cyclic all right so if you see somebody say cyclic four ring four carbon compound that means that it's in a ring okay cyclic means ring so that's another term that you might see uh, I just want to kind of go ahead and say that in case they don't mention it anywhere else so you can have it either in a chain or as a ring All right, um, organic compounds can absolutely contain other atoms besides carbon and hydrogen. When it just has hydrogen and carbon, we call that a hydrocarbon. Um, but not very original, I admit. Any atom that is not carbon or hydrogen is called a heteroatom. We don't use that term that much, so I'm not that concerned about that. Um, common heteroatoms are nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Uh, and that's just because of the nature of the way they bond. Like I said, carbon likes to have um, four bonds around it. So with nitrogen, it can typically uh, make that triple bond there if it wants to, or it can just bond once. Nitrogen will typically have three bonds. Oxygen will typically have two. Okay, so all of these different atoms kind of follow their own patterns, and all that goes back to the valence electrons that we were talking about, right? Um, oxygen has six valence electrons, so it likes to accept two electrons, and bonding to two different atoms can give it those two extra electrons it needs to fill the octet. Dog's eating over here. Uh, let's see what else we have. And this is what it uh, was talking about, right? Nitrogen typically has three bonds. Oxygen typically has two. Halogens, which are in group seven, have one, uh, seven valence electrons and likes to accept one electron from somewhere else. That's how come it only has one bond usually, okay? Very few exceptions for that, but there are exceptions. I don't know that you'll see one in this course, though. And then this is a neat little way for them to get the two bonds on the oxygen, but keep four bonds on the carbon. We typically will see a double bond oxygen to a carbon, okay? And we have uh, names for the carbon in this situation. It's called a carbonyl. But I'll come back to that. It should go over all of the different names here in a minute. All right. First up, we want to talk about uh, the angle that these molecules bond at. So when you get to do working on Alex, it will tell you sometimes that your angle isn't right. Okay. So I'm just going to do one here first starting out. Uh, when I create four bonds of a carbon... 
we look at it like this and we think that these are square 90 degrees but in actuality they're not okay and that is because you have to think of these molecules being three-dimensional okay let me get uh, a molecule here and just put me on the screen all right so this is that same carbon molecule that I just drew on paper okay and see here when I draw it flat on paper it looks like it's a square almost like these are 90 degrees but it's not okay really it's something like hundred and three degrees it's a little bit past a right angle and that's because it's in three dimensions so one of them is coming out of the page one of them is going into the page and then the other two are flat with the page okay if I'm looking at a 2d representation and so what we've done uh, in chemistry is come up with different ways or means of illustrating uh, which kind of bond and what the orientation of the molecule is. Okay? So that's what these slides are going to kind of go over. If it's just two in a line, and you should remember this, we kind of covered it uh, briefly in Survey of Chem 1 with the Vesper model, valence shell electron repulsion theory. All right, if I have two in a line, if two molecules bonded to each other, they're going to be linear, right? This goes in a straight line that's 180, okay? If I add one more, so I can't do it with this molecule I have, but it's going to split that charge evenly. Remember, this is a hydrogen, this is a hydrogen, so it kind of pulls evenly to each side, um, and it's still linear. But once I start making it three-dimensional, like the CH4 molecule that I started with, ah, I can't do it. The the shape changes. Okay, I think we call this a uh, trigonal pyramidal, or t excuse me, tetrahedral. Uh, if it was five, it'd be trigonal pyramidal. But since there's four atoms around it, we call this a tetrahedral. And then there's bond angles that are associated with that and everything. Okay, I say all that just to say this. When you get to drawing these molecules on paper and you put a right angle, uh, say this is a carbon, this is a carbon, and uh, I don't want to do that. If I put this molecule in Alex, it's going to send it back and say that that's not right. Okay, that's because molecules don't have a 90 degree angle in a tetrahedral right we said it's more like 103 so what you're going to end up doing is kind of doing more like V's like this okay and that's because we actually have molecules like that okay you see this is no longer a 90 degree angle it's actually a little more. It's probably closer to the 103 number that we want. So that's why I, I say all that just to say when it tells you that an angle is not right, make sure you don't have any right angles because you're not going to see any in this. Um, if it's just three bonds coming in, that's going to be 120 on each angle. And then if it's, uh, let me see if it's two bonds, it's linear and it's 180 right that's 180 degrees and then if it's four bonds it's more like uh, 105 or so okay so you're not going to have these right angles uh, in chemistry and so when you get to working on Alex and they tell you your angles not right that's probably what it has to do with okay so let's go back here and it's going to talk some more about shapes and I imagine it'll mention something what I just said. Okay, so at three angles it's 120, four groups it's 109. Okay, I said 105. It's 109.5 is the angle for a tetrahedral. So it's not a right angle. If you're putting them in at right angles you might get it wrong, uh, but it should let you know that that's why you got it wrong, not something else. All right, let's see what's next. Okay, remember I was talking about uh, coming in and out of the page, right? 
when you look at this molecule on a page it's hard to tell which one's coming at you and which one's going back so what we've done is come up with the wedge and dash model is one way that we can tell you hey that's going behind the page this one's coming out okay the dashes means it's going back away from you and then the wedge means the solid wedge means it's coming at you out of the page towards you okay so this is one way that you can illustrate three dimensions uh, on a flat sheet of paper all right so and then it'll also allow you to draw it this way on um, Alex actually I'll, I'll go to Alex before we leave today and just kind of show you what I mean how to draw these things um, and what to pay attention to as far as line angles and stuff like that okay uh, nitrogen yeah I mean typically it's bonded with three uh, it has this lone pair though so it ends up forming a tetrahedral in that case but it's not quite 109 and that just has to do with uh, the lone pair of electrons I'm not real concerned about that I don't think they ask you anything about that in Alex either so we'll just kind of skip that but it is important to remember that some of these atoms have lone pairs and when it has a lone pair you have to act like it's a tetrahedral so let me go back to paint real quick just to kind of explain this concept uh, let's do a new one don't save okay let's take uh, water for example water is H2O alright and I draw it like this if this was just the two hydrogens then I would draw it in a linear fashion like I just showed you with that other molecule right and the angle will be uh, 180 but oxygen has lone electrons it has two lone pair of electrons so it ends up doing this right here one two oh my mouse ain't working uh, one two uh, hydrogen right there hydrogen right here okay so I have to treat both of these lone pairs like it's a region of the atom so really this is a tetrahedral it has four regions around the central atom that would make it a tetrahedral now the bond angle as our uh, PowerPoint was just saying is not 109 anymore because it has those two valence electrons well actually it says it is 109 but it should have a little uh, more bend it's actually 109 so it's a little less than the 109.5 from a standard tetrahedral but that's just because these two long pairs of electrons kind of push away and cause this to bend in can you see that let me come in okay so this is like a standard tetrahedral this that molecule that I just took apart that had the four regions on it all right when these two lone pairs are up top here it actually kind of pushes in on these two so that angle closes just a little bit okay that's how come that occurs I don't know that that's important for Alex or anything uh, I doubt I'll ask it on the test either but just so that we're covering all our bases here okay and then that goes back to the shape of the molecules all right now we're going to talk about how we represent these different structures on paper okay so we talked about the wedge and the dash um, and you've also seen me kind of draw some other formulas on my paint program the the skeletal models anyway so there are basically three different things there's the condensed structural formula all right uh, the expanded structural formula let me see where that is ba -ba. I figured you would start with expanded first okay so this is kind of the expanded structural formula right 
these carbons right here where I write out every single carbon and every single hydrogen. Now that can get very tedious when you're talking about molecules that are 100 carbons long or something like that. So what we've done is we have condensed them, thus we call them uh, condensed structural formulas. And in a condensed structural formula, I can kind of minimize all of these H's. I can just say, instead of writing each H out, I can say CH3. Uh, CH2, CH2, CH3, so on and so forth, okay? I still get all of the information I need, right? Four carbons in this one, there's four carbons in this one. Same number of hydrogens in the expanded model or in the condensed model, right? But there are some limitations to this, right? In the expanded model, I can say, well, it comes off, the, the carbon chain goes this way, right? There's two methyl groups, one comes off to the top, uh, one comes off to the bottom. In a condensed structural formula, you might not be able to see that. So there are some drawbacks to the condensed structural formula. And um, in fact, you'll see uh, what we call isomers where you can have multiple different kind of molecules with the same condensed structural formula. And uh, you'll see more of that, especially when you get into lab. Uh, let's see, where was our expanded? Expanded, so sample problem, convert those into condensed structural formulas. And then I imagine it'll go through there and do that. See here how it has just two methyl groups coming off of that carbon. So these are just kind of basic rules. You'll just follow along. Try these out. Uh, you will do some of this in Alex as well. So. It's not a bad idea to kind of practice here and then go into Alex and try it. All right, next up we have the skeletal structure. Uh, it's also called a line diagram. So in a line diagram, we are getting rid of all of the C's and the H's, okay? And the way we do that is we just assume that everything that's not labeled, every end of every line is a carbon. Okay, so this has got five carbons in it. One here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. Okay, but in the skeletal formula, we don't write out any C's. Each end of a line is a carbon, and we know this. Uh, another thing we don't do is write out all the H's. If I know that every carbon has to have four bonds, and this carbon here, let's call this carbon one, this carbon two, uh, it's hard to write small. Okay, carbon one is bound to carbon two. So each carbon needs three more bonds somewhere. Well, these are filled with H's, okay? And I don't have to write anything in a skeletal formula. In a, if I wanted to make it into an expanded uh, formula, like, yeah, expanded structural formula, then I would have to write out every C and every H, okay? Notice that this carbon here, carbon two, has a carbon bond on one side and a carbon bond on another. So two of its bonds, two of its four possible bonds are taken up by the carbon. So I only need to add in two hydrogens up here. Same for this one. It's bonded to two carbons. I can only put two hydrogens. This one is bonded to two carbons, so I can only put two hydrogen. Now when I get to the end, I'm back to having this carbon only has one bond coming into it, so that means there's room for three hydrogens, okay? So you just, with a skeletal formula, you know that there are C's and H's there, but you don't have to write them out. It's important for you to get familiar being able to count them though. How many carbons are in the main chain? How many carbons are in uh, the molecule total, how many hydrogens are in the molecule. And so you'll see question, a lot of questions like that. It'll draw a skeletal formula and you'll say, well, how many hydrogens are here? Just uh, do an example, let's do one. Okay, so this is a one, two, three, four carbon. Okay, so there's four carbons there. Uh, now let's figure out how many hydrogens. So three from this end three from that end, 
and then two here in the middle, right? I should have circled it. So the circled R is the number of the carbon. One, two, three, four carbons, and the underlined ones are the number of hydrogens. Okay, so uh, three, six, ten hydrogens. So it's going to be important for you to kind of get familiar with all these different ways of uh, writing formulas, structural formulas. And you'll see, you'll get plenty of practice. You'll get to do it some in uh, Alex, but you'll also use this pretty much all the time going forward. Okay, because skeletal formulas are much easier to do than condensed formulas or even expanded formulas because there's a lot less writing, obviously, but uh, it's also easier to manipulate right and easier to change things when you don't have to take off 10 hydrogens all right let's see what else so same thing with the ring molecules uh, ball and stick model every now and then you'll see something like that that's just like a 3d printing and it's like a printed 3d representation and usually what they'll do there is they'll use colors on the ball and stick models to kind of signify uh, certain atoms, right? I think oxygen is usually blue or red. Nitrogen is usually green or red, something like that. Um, Carbon is usually black. Hydrogen is usually white, something like that. All right, so now... We're going to talk about functional groups, and this is just going to be like memorization, okay? There's only about like 10 different functional groups that you're going to need to be familiar with. Uh, hydrocarbons contain only carbon and hydrogen. Uh, alkanes are single carbon-carbon bonds. Alkenes are when a carbon-carbon has a double bond, and an alkyne, Y-N-E, is when they have a triple bond. Aromatic rings, also called benzene rings, are a cyclic compound that has resonance. So let me see if here is a cyclic compound here on the bottom. Uh, and you see how it has these double bonds. It skips a bond, then double bond, skips a bond, double bond, skips a bond, double bond. That's called aromatic. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk much about what aromaticity is or resonance or anything um, if we come to it later in the course we will but it's basically just saying that these electrons go all around the ring okay that double bond doesn't stay there long it actually moves to the right and then the one beside that gets pushed on further around and they just keep doing this little circle where the the electron is split between all six carbons those three electrons from those double bonds are actually split evenly between all six carbons around the ring. And we call that being aromatic. And it has significant impact when you're talking about bonding, uh, colorization, right? A lot of our color that we see with our eyes has to do with the way light interacts with these type of bonds. So it's very important in chemistry, but I don't think we're going to go too deep, at least, especially not this chapter, we're not going to go that deep into any of that. All right, so here are kind of the nuts and bolts, some of the functional groups that you need to be concerned with. Uh, alkyl halide just means it has a halogen attached. Uh, alcohol means it has an OH attached. Ether is when a carbon is a carbons are attached to both sides of an oxygen an amine has a nitrogen group on there a thiol a sulfur and then you'll see a couple others let's see this is just an example of an ether we'll get on that all right here is this is better Okay, here are five uh, functional groups that you need to be able to recognize in a molecule. First one is called aldehyde. Aldehyde always has a double bonded oxygen and, oh, let's clear this off. Okay, so aldehyde will always have this double bonded oxygen 
and then on this side a hydrogen okay uh, something else could be a carbon could be a hydrogen anything anything really coming off of here okay that is you know whatever but uh, aldehyde always has this double bonded oxygen connected to a hydrogen okay this carbon in the middle remember that's a carbon there is connected to a hydrogen on one side and a double bonded oxygen uh, on top this carbon actually has a special name itself and you might want to remember this so take a note of it it's called a carbonyl okay and uh my mouse gets stuck right on there on the edge of my little pad carbonyl carbon anytime you see a double bonded oxygen to a carbon we're going to call that a carbonyl okay but this molecule is uh, in the functional group it's an aldehyde okay now the next one also has a double bonded O but it doesn't have the hydrogen okay remember I said it always has a hydrogen coming off this one can have another carbon so I'm gonna do carbon I'm gonna do carbon I'm gonna do carbon and right here the double bonded O okay so if this right here is not a hydrogen but a carbon then that means we call this a ketone oh right with the mouse is so ugly all right now this carbon here is still a carbonyl okay I'm not gonna write it yeah I am I'm almost there that carbon is still called a carbonyl so aldehydes have a carbonyl and ketones have a carbonyl uh, esters do as well carboxylic acids a lot of different functional groups have that carbonyl with the double bonded O. So your job is just to distinguish whether or not it's a ketone or an aldehyde. If this right here is an H, is a hydrogen atom, then that be called this will be an aldehyde. And then there's another one. So double bonded O connected to another O and then to an H. We call this one. A carboxylic acid okay and this can be just whatever they put R R just means the rest okay it's the rest of everything else that's going that way we're not that concerned because I'm just testing you on whether or not what what functional group is this this one is called a carboxylic acid all right oh my gosh carboxylic acid okay and then there's one more I'm not gonna take everything away I'm just gonna take a little bit if this H is not a H but it's a another carbon actually I'm just gonna do a new one that's taking way too long if that carbonyl remember this is still a carbonyl here right that is still a carbonyl um, if this O is not connected to an H but is connected to another carbon uh, now I'm gonna put R over here or whatever this is called an ester okay not to be confused with ether right we just looked at an ether an ether is when it's an O no double bond just carbon over here carbon over here this is called an ether all right so ester has the double bond has the extra oxygen but has a carbon right here instead of the hydrogen okay so having a hydrogen versus a carbon can change it can change a uh, ketone to an aldehyde it can change an ester to a carboxylic acid all right and then the last group i'm going to look at is the um the amide okay the amide has the carbonyl carbon but it connects to an amine remember we said that anything with an N is an amine group or amino so if you see a nitrogen you're automatically thinking either amine or amide and if it has that double bonded O it is an amide and I'm saying that I'm saying that kind of quick, but it's A M I D E. 
amid. I hear some, uh, I think Dr. Taylor calls it an amid. Um, I call it an amide. But, uh, yeah, so that, that covers most all the functional groups. Let me see if they go into anything else. Nah, it just talks about each one. So uh, the aldehyde, the ketone, carboxylic acid. Uh, be familiar, be able to recognize these different molecules. And you'll get a lot of practice on these, particularly in uh, Alex. Okay, identify all the functional groups in this uh, drug, Tamiflu. All right, so I see an oxygen here. It's got a carbon on each side, no double bond. So I'm going to call that uh, an ether, right? Uh, let's see what else. There's an amine here, the nitrogen. That's an amine. Uh, there's another nitrogen here, but there's a double bond off of the carbonyl. So that means it's an amide, right? Um, let me see, two oxygens with C's on both sides. Anytime two oxygens are together like that, it has to be uh, that carboxylic acid type setup with the carbonyl carbon, double bonded O, and another O beside it. Now, whether or not it's a carboxylic acid or not depends on whether or not one of these O's has an H coming off of it. Actually, there's a carbon on both sides. So I'm going to call that an ester. Let me go back up here and just show y'all what I was talking about. Ester, ester. Which one was it here, I think? Here's the carboxylic acid. You see when it's wrote out in condensed structural formula, uh, there's the two O's, O2. So I know that that's the carbonyl carbon with another O, but there's an H attached there. If it were an ester, there'd be either a C, right, like this right here, the double O, and then another C. So I know that that was an ester. Let's go back to the example problem. All right, so I know O2, CO2, that's got to be the carbonyl carbon with low, extra low oxygen, but there's a C attached, so it has to be an ester not a carboxylic acid. If it was a carboxylic acid, all this would be gone and it'd just have an H on the end. And then they redraw it and they mention all the different uh, groups that we have there. All right, let's look quickly at some of the properties. Um, organic compounds are only have uh, covalent bonds and if you remember a little bit from survey one that's because ionic bonds uh, have polarity right there's different charges between uh, a metal uh, and a non-metal all right they have very different charges electronegativities they're on opposite ends of the spectrum those opposite charges are what causes them to attract and that's how we get ionic bonds. But carbon and carbon have the same charge, essentially. So anytime they connect, it has to be a covalent bond. All right. And then there's a few little points that we can make about um, organic compounds in general. Typically, long organic compounds, like say more than three carbon, four carbon long, they are insoluble in water, right? Uh, think about like gasoline. Uh, oil. Oil is a good example of a long carbon chain. Uh, usually, you know, dozens and dozens of carbons chained together. Oil and water don't mix. And that's because uh, carbon is a nonpolar. Carbon, long carbon chains of molecules are nonpolar. They don't have charge. So there's nowhere for that water, which is a very polar molecule, uh, to kind of fit around and hold those molecules out of solution. So in fact, the oil will stay with the other oil, the water will stay with the other water, and they won't mix. Now, very small carbon chains can be soluble. Uh, it's usually like less than three, less than four carbon chain length. And then it talks about some of the difference between ionic and covalent. As we just said, ionic has 
a lot of charge in it so it typically is soluble in water uh, anything that's nonpolar is typically not going to dissolve in water. And that's essentially what all these slides are going to tell you. All right. So I'm just going to skip till they're not talking about polarity anymore because we don't. You don't have any in Alex, I'm pretty sure, as far as polarity. Uh, but that's just kind of a general thing that you can think about why uh, organic molecules don't mix with water is because they're nonpolar and these large carbon chains don't form any real significant charge which is how water dissolves everything right it dissolves salt by breaking the Na plus from the Cl minus wrapping itself around all that the salt dissipates and spreads all throughout the water rule of solubility like dissolves like so nonpolar molecule is going to dissolve nonpolar excuse me a nonpolar solvent is going to dissolve nonpolar molecules and a polar solvent like water is going to dissolve polar molecules like salts ions stuff like that and I think the rest of this is just a focus on health yeah so I'm gonna skip that now it didn't mention the naming aspect of it I guess they're gonna wait till uh, we get to chapter 12 but I do think that they name um, that you'll name some molecules in chapter 11 Alex so just real quickly I want to find naming alkane chart and I think I'll add this onto your cougar view okay so we do have these prefixes okay um, that lets us know how many carbons are in a molecule right uh, meth is one carbon eth two carbons pro three but four pent five hex six hept seven uh, octane you've heard octo whatever so that's eight no name decane okay so that's I'm gonna copy this chart and add it on to our cougar view just so that you have something to use but I think she goes over in the naming alkanes thing too so I'll put this video in this chart in chapter 12 as well um, oh, I couldn't download it Yeah, so I'll put that chart there just in case you do do some naming for Alex. Um, but this is a good start, okay? So go through and watch these other videos too. Uh, she's just going to reiterate a lot of the same things that I'm saying, but it also she also starts to go into naming alkanes, which uh, even if you don't see any of it in the Alex for this chapter, you will see it in the next chapter, so it'll be fine to go ahead and get started. All right? Um, that's it for today. I will see y'all next time. Bye.